guess it started. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll get restarted, I guess. Um, so my name is Akshay Naik. Um, my group predominantly works on uh, nanoelectromechanical systems. If you heard of uh, MEMS, uh, microelectromechanical systems, these are uh, MEMS are uh, micron-sized devices. What we are working on are uh, nanoscale uh, devices. Uh, in general, my uh, interest is um, how to do very sensitive measurements uh, of any sensor. So it doesn't have to be NEMS, but in general, how do you do measurements at extreme scale? Um, okay, so some of the research areas uh, that my group is uh, in. Uh, uh, so what we look for is in these uh, nanoelectromechanical systems, which we call NEMS, we try to see uh, where are the uh, what are the noise sources, where are they coming from, because they are going to affect the mechanism that that uh, that we use these devices. For. Okay. So we use these devices for uh, sensing. Uh, for instance, we use these devices for uh, mass spectrometry. That's what we want to do. Um, I'll talk about that in a bit. And we use these devices to study nonlinear dynamics. Okay. Um, so, so what we do is with these devices, we do sensing at extreme level. For instance, you must have used weighing scales to measure uh, your weight, right? So, what do you use to uh, measure the mass of inertial mass of proteins? So, what we are planning is to use these. Uh, small devices, NEMS devices, which are nothing but just uh, string-like structures, but at nanoscale, right? So we are going to use these devices to measure uh, mass of proteins so that we can figure out what proteins are there uh, in the cell because the proteins are going to determine what, what kind of diseases you are going to get, your uh, body is behaving, how your body is behaving, and so on. Okay, so uh, one of the things that happens is with these sensors is uh, the, the resolution, which is uh, the minimum mass that you can measure um, with these devices, uh, reduces as you make devices small. So you could be in measurements with the bigger uh, systems. Uh, if you ever uh, heard of quartz crystal uh, oscillators, they can measure in nanograms. But when you make devices smaller in MEMS and NEM scale, you can really measure extremely small uh, masses. NEMS devices can measure mass of uh, protein molecules. So we can do uh, measurements of proteins. Okay. So in fact, um, about a few years ago, uh, people showed that if you have a single nanotube, single carbon nanotube, um, you can measure mass of uh, a hydrogen atom. In principle, that can be done. Um, on the right, uh, uh, in the graph, what you see is uh, step-like structures. Each of those uh, downward shifts is because of one protein molecule that has landed on these uh, NEMS devices. So we can actually measure mass of uh, individual uh, proteins. We can me measure they have arrived at our device. Okay. 
Okay, so that's one thing that uh, we are uh, interested in. Okay. So if you want to do these measurements at uh, these extremely uh, sensitive scale, what you have to know is how uh, is the performance of the sensor affected by various things, right? So if you ever looked at uh, resonance of a device, uh, say pendulum, this is what it looks like. Amplitude versus frequency looks like this. Uh, there is a peak. Amplitude is maximum at the resonant frequency. So if a protein or uh, any molecule that comes and sits on uh, the device that we have, the, the frequency changes. And that's what we measure. This change in frequency is what we measure. So what is the minimum that you can measure? It is determined by uh, the signal to noise that we have. <clears throat> so another question that we try to ask is, where is the noise coming from in these sensors? Uh, what is the origin of this? Noise? We uh, reduce these noise sources. How do we get? And if there is a maximum in the signal, what uh, provides the maximum limit in these uh, devices? How do we improve the maximum signal that we can get out of these devices? So that's something uh, that uh, we also look at. Okay. Uh, we also look at uh, uh, nonlinear dynamics in these devices. Unfortunately, I'm not able to play uh, the video. Oh, maybe. Oh, no. Um, but if you type internal resonance uh, in YouTube, you should be able to get a, a video where uh, uh, this person is uh, how nonlinear uh, coupling or nonlinear systems uh, give. Uh, effects right so for instance you all have seen a uh, pendulum you probably also have looked at, at a spring mass system but what you can do is you can make a, a combined kind of system where you have a pendulum uh, with string instead of string you have a spring right so what you can do is uh, uh, you um, uh, actuate the spring mass system and instead of uh, going up and it will also do oscillatory motion. So this is all uh, because of nonlinear uh, effects in these devices, uh, in these NEMSs. So those are also some of the things that we try to study. Okay. Uh, some of the other interests that I have, uh, other than uh, NEMS devices, is uh, DNA sequencing. That's something that I'm, uh, my group is doing in collaboration with uh, Manoj Verma and a few more uh, people. Here, what we try to do is uh, we try to fabricate a stack of nanopores and we try to uh, send DNA uh, uh, these nanopores so that we can detect uh, the, uh, the DNA uh, as it's passing through. We are also interested in figuring out how do we make uh, readout schemes that are able to distinguish uh, the basis in these uh, DNA. The problem is the DNA uh, passes through these pores fairly quickly, so it's important to make readout schemes which are uh, fast. Okay, so that's something that we're interested. We're interested in strain engineering. Uh, we work with a lot of 2D materials uh, like graphene and so on. So we're interested in how uh, the effect of uh, how the strain affects the properties 2D materials. Would like to use uh, these uh, strain to uh, make tandem devices. For instance, you make two different devices with the same material, uh, but with different strain, and try to make some uh, interesting devices out of those uh, materials. Okay. Um, another thing that we are interested in is how do we use quantum effects in um, doing sensing, right? So, for instance, a squid. Uh, a very well-known example sensing where you're using the quantum effect to do some uh, uh, sensing. Right? Since we are trying to ask what uh, quantum effects can be used for sensing, especially when uh, we have uh, when you can couple an EMS device to it. Uh, the other question that we are trying to answer in these cases is: uh, our devices quantum effects are. Uh, uh, not uh, robust. They are very sensitive. So how do you uh, figure out readout mechanisms that are able to read out these uh, quant quantum effects and still be usable? Right? So that's those are some of the things um, uh, that my group is working on. And um, so I'll now let uh, the next faculty member talk about his uh, research. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> No, no, this is the sentence. There's something that says 2017. Ah. So, hello, everybody. This is uh, Manoj Varma. So, the general research area that I'm looking at in my lab currently is sensory signal processing and biological systems. Now, what this means is that uh, you know there is a lot of work that goes on here in sensing, sensing of various variables. Like for example, pressure sensors, temperature. Actually, I talked about mass sensors. So we work on a lot of different sensors. Now, my approach is to look at organisms and then try to understand with what kind of efficiencies do these sensors operate and to explore whether there is something that we can learn. So as an example, uh, many insects and animals in general, they have very well developed uh, olfactory capability. That means that they can smell things very effectively. Dogs, for example, can smell out. I mean, dogs are used in uh, you know, detective work. They can really smell very effectively, right? The question is, is there anything that we can learn from these sensors for example, to make better gas sensors uh, and uh, you know, such systems. So this has been one approach that I've been pursuing with actively in my lab. And the topics that I have for this year is connected with this, this general area. So the topic, uh, there are two topics. One of them is sensing and decision making in bacterial colonies. Okay. So even very small organisms like bacteria. So bacteria are typically about a micron in size. So these bacteria, sometimes they, uh, they live in large colonies consisting of millions of individuals. So typically 10 million individuals. And they are able to sense their environment. By sense, what we mean is that we are, they are able to measure the chemical concentrations in their environment and then make decisions based on that. So for example, they may find something attractive, some chemical that is attractive, and then they can actually guide themselves towards that attractor. And all these, this behavior is very coherent. The entire colony moves or changes directions, and so it's, the motion is very coordinated. Is that a problem? No. Okay. So uh, we want to understand how how is it that these bacteria well, are very limited in their abilities to coordinate their decision making in such large colonies. So this is one topic that I'm looking for students in this area. I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more details about what I expect from students in these topics. But anyway, this is one topic. So this will, uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about what this involves. The second topic that I have is chemotactic robots. Now what this term means is that, so chemotaxis, technical term. Axis is a word that refers to motion, directed motion. That is like you're going somewhere. So that directed motion is called taxis. Associate the word chemo with it. It means motion directed based on a chemical gradient. So the idea in this project is to be able to make robots or rather artificial mobile systems able to guide themselves based on chemical signals, just like an insect or a dog uh, would move. So the idea here is that uh, the learning that we get from uh, bacterial colonies and so on can be employed in the system to be able to explore what are the most efficient strategies and what is the role of sensitivity and, and things like that. So both of these projects involve uh, some amount of biomimetics, some amount of studying biological systems, and then applying them in, in a So the idea, of course, as I pointed out earlier, the idea is that if you study biological systems, then it may be possible for us to make better uh, engineered uh, sensors. Uh, but what we mean by understanding the biological system is that we should be able to formulate quantitative models. So it's not enough to just observe some, uh, you know, something in experiment. We should be able to, to some hypothesis on how this is happening in the system 
we must be able to formulate quantitative models, be able to simulate them, and to see whether these simulations match with experiments. So this is this is, a, this is going to be the general strategy in both of these uh, topics. So there's going to be experimentation as well as mathematical modeling. So therefore, the kind of uh, the expectation that I have from the PhD students for both of these topics is that uh, we should be able to fabricate micro and mesoscale devices for probing this. As I told you, we want to study. So bacteria are in, at the micron scale. So of course, we can study them in their native environment. You can you know you can make large uh, sort of uh, agar plates and so on to study them, but uh, you can get much more information if you. Are able to scale devices. Okay. So, of course, you know that about the fabrication facilities that we have to use that, make devices. For instance, we might make microfluidic devices to probe the bacteria in greater detail. There is some amount of fabrication that will be involved. Then there will be video microscopy. So, we have image, imaging systems that we have built by ourselves in our, in our lab. And we will be using such systems to record motion of bacteria, behavior of bacteria under different conditions. And then we will be analyzing them using image processing algorithms. So we will be tracking the bacterial path. We will be, we'll be looking at the statistics of motion and so on. And as I already told you, there will be a reasonable amount of quantitative modeling. So we will be actually making some mathematical models and studying their behavior in MATLAB or uh, software uh, environment. Basically, I'm looking for a person for both of these projects, looking for a person who is excited to work with a biological. We are, we are collaborating with a biology lab in this. So we want somebody who is comfortable in working with biological systems, which means that you know you might be illusions and reagents and so on. But not only that, an aptitude, a good aptitude for mathematics and for programming, because a lot of we'll be doing a lot of simulations and uh, we'll be doing a lot of mathematical analysis, studying, for instance, what will be, uh, for example, limit of you know taking limits and then things like that. Uh, so so uh, some basic aptitude in mathematics and programming is required for the project. Uh, so this is basically what I had uh, for this year, uh, two topics, uh, both of them connected with biology, but with a significant amount of mathematics uh, and fabrication involved. So that's all I have. And then if you have further questions, you can ask me through the chat session and I'll be able to answer. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Prashanjit, and uh, I'll be talking about two different areas. And different areas. Uh, uh, I've been I've been proposing three uh, three different projects in these two different areas. So the first area is uh, looking into three D integration and system scaling. And uh, uh, I would first start by uh, giving you an idea about what does it mean when I talk about three D integration and system scaling. So what you see on the monitor is a progression that the electronics industry has taken. So 10 years back, the best computing devices we had were mostly in the form of uh, com uh, top computers. Now, most of, the, most of the computational devices are in the devices, either in the form of cell phones or in the form of uh, uh, tablets. And if you think about them, these smartphones and the tablets are computationally as good as uh, the computers or the desktops 10 years uh, before used to be. This argument has not just taken place because of the scaling of the transistors, the chips, but also a significant improvement in the packaging and inter integration where PCB from uh, at the bottom left, you see a PCB from a desktop computer. And now that has scaled a small size PCB or an integrated platform 
that exists on the cell phones. What is also interesting to note is that these smartphones today are multifunctional. In computers or desktop previously just do computation. Today's smartphone are able to do much more. They are able to sense your environment. They are able to sense your motion. They can listen to you. They can uh, wirelessly communicate with other devices. So these devices are becoming more and more multifunctional. Now, if we want to take this kind of power into the smaller form factors, such as smart watches or even smaller form factors, then this additional form of integration and packaging is not enough. What we need to do is look into uh, 3D heterogeneous integration, which we believe will drive the scaling of the future devices. So what you see is a 3D integrated stack. And this is what we are trying to achieve here, where we are trying to achieve a stack of multiple chips of different kinds integrated in a three-dimensional fashion. So coming to the projects, what we have developed here at ISC is that we have developed a technology called ultra thin hybrid stacks where we are able to integrate chips with thickness all the way down to 10 microns. 10 microns, uh, to give you an idea about what 10 microns is, 10 microns is approximately 10 times smaller than the thickness of a paper, standard paper, or 10 times smaller uh, than the diameter of the hair. Now, using this technology and using it for high power RF devices is a significant challenge in two terms. First is, how do you keep the signal integrity when you are uh, talking about vertical signal uh, transmission through these chips or through the stack? Into that aspect, the RF aspect of these, uh, RF aspect of uh, making these stacks work. And the second challenge comes due to the thermal because we are now stacking the devices in three dimension it is more it becomes more and more difficult for the heat to exit the stack and how efficiently can we take the heat away from the stack will uh, be the challenge of this project so details uh, we are looking into transmit receive modules which are critical for several rf applications these in general are made by assembling discrete components in 2D. We want to take this 2D discrete setup and convert it into a 3D such that we can make them uh, extremely small. The aim will be to enable RF electronics on ultra thin hybrid stacks. And aim of the second project will be to enable integration of high power on ultra thin hybrid stacks. Uh, background in mechanical, electrical, or electronics engineering is desirable, but mandatory. The second project in this area is with Professor Digbijoy. And this is about transferring uh, flex, uh, transferring a GAN from a standard silicon substrate to glass or flexibly engineered surfaces, such that we can optimize them for performance. And normally, these uh, GAN devices are grown on silicon or silicon carbide, and what we will try to do is transfer this very thin layer of uh, GAN algan stack, which is approximately three to five microns thick. Other kind of substrates which are which provide which will provide much better performance in uh, terms of heat, uh, in terms of performance and uh, flexible substrate for next generation technology. Again, in this a background in mechanical electronics is required not mandatory. What is desirable is that there is a good understanding in semiconductors. Uh, so that was the first area. The second area where another project is available for the interdisciplinary program is in micro and nanofluidics. Uh, and in this, uh, what we are looking at is we are trying to develop high throughput microfluidics uh, sorting for enrichment of circulating tumor cells from blood of cancer patients. So brief uh, idea about what CTCs are. CTCs are the uh, cells which uh, actually come out from the, uh, the primary tumor, go into the blood, circulate all over the blood, and then they go into the uh, different organs and leads to uh, cell tumors in those organs. Understanding how these CTCs behave and being able to detect them is has uh, 
is being uh, projected as a good way of uh, uh, understanding the disease and treating the disease. So, uh, what kind of uh, what is the challenge in this problem? Uh, if you look into a blood of one microliter blood, will approximately have five million red blood cells. It will around four to eleven thousand white blood cells. Whereas, if we are talking about CTCs, the concentration of CTCs goes down to around one per billion blood cell cells. And the aim of this project will be to develop a microfluidic platform which will allow us to separate these CTC cells from other cells. So these are the products uh, that are available uh, with uh, my group. Uh, so if you have any other questions, um, I will be available over the chat to answer them. Said that send it to me, so I send it to you. Should I? You can go to your email address. So did you send my sense mail or hmm. sense mail? Is this the right one? I think it's a big one. 
can go by date. Date modifier. Date modifier. They're not yet seeing this. Okay, seeing the yes. camera now. Okay, they're not seeing. Okay, I just need to edit a small thing here. Can I edit this? Where is it? Yeah. He's, he's, he's going to share Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rudra Pratap, and uh, I work mostly on MEMS devices and all uh, processes and related to uh, you know what we do to devices. So my current research divide into four bins, if you will. Uh, one on MEMS sensors, so that is on sensor development. Uh, the second one is on energy harvesting devices. Uh, third is uh, materials synthesis, and uh, last one is mechanobiology. So I'll, I'll tell you about each one. On MEMS sensors, we work on various kinds of sensors, but most of the sensors that interest me are that have uh, motion associated with them, dynamic MEM sensors. So those could be acoustic MEM sensors like microphones or uh, speakers, or uh, uh, ultrasound speakers. So ultrasound speakers generally come in two flavors. Uh, one is called a CMUT, capacitive micro machine ultrasound transducer, and the other one is PMUTs, piezoelectric micro machine ultrasound transducers. So, um, you know, for last five, six years, we have been working a lot on PMUTs, and we have developed uh, different kinds of PMUTs for a variety of applications. Uh, I also work on gyroscopes and accelerometers, and, um, switches. These are uh, acceleration-based based, uh, mechanical switches for enabling some event or the other. Uh, mostly, this is used in uh, defense. Um, on energy harvesting, uh, in that area, there is uh, quite a bit of work on piezoelectric uh, material development, which then can be used. So for MEMS devices, we need uh, thin films of piezoelectric materials. And 
And that's not a trivial thing if you want uh, device quality piezoelectric films. Uh, so there is quite a bit of work on uh, piezoelectric thin film development as well as then taking these uh, thin films and making and then you know how to make hybrid energy harvesters with uh, electromagnetic uh, elements um, combined with them. Uh, so we work on you know scaling of these devices from uh, very very small MEMS energy harvesters to mesoscale devices. In materials and processes, um, there is one particular uh, phenomenon called electromigration that uh, I'm involved in studying for last several years, and uh, this this particular phenomenon is about mass transport of materials at nanoscales using electric field. So based on that, we have come up with some technology that can do nanoscale lithography. And right now, we are developing an instrument, a tool that can be used for nanoscale lithography using electromigration. So there are a bunch of papers we have published already on electromigration given on the technology we have patented the technology and now we are uh, working on um, but there is so much more to study in this uh, electro migration itself you know how metals and liquid metals behave in electro migration how do you control them and if you can control then you can possibly do you know uh, repairing at nanoscales um, by moving material with electromigration uh, along the way that you would like to. So there are lots of things um, that one can study. Particularly, this is very good for patterning, you know, um, uh, automatically patterning surfaces by created flow of materials and creating all kinds of textures. Um, we also are making a zinc oxide based nanostructures uh, from microwave uh, technology, from microwave uh, synthesis. And we have been able to synthesize all kinds of zinc oxide nanostructures. Of particular interest to me are uh, rods, vertical growth of rods, which we can then use as uh, piezoelectric uh, materials of piezoelectric rods, and that again, um, in turn, can be used in um, energy harvesting. As well as, you know, I mean, you can use these nanostructures for uh, other actions as well, for example, gas sensing and so forth, and so on. What I think is that most of our um, ideas for sensors and actuators at nano and micro scale they have to, they will come from nature, where nature uses these, uh, at this scale, many sensors. For example, you take insects. Insects have, uh, you know, lots of sensors, extremely small sensors. So how are those sensors designed by nature? What is the scaling law that nature is using? What is the template that it uses? for the same sensor in different insects of sensitivities and uh, different kinds of range of operation. So once we understand from insects how these sensors work and how their engineering is done, then we can use that in, um, in you know, MEMS or uh, MEMS sensors as well. I'll show you one example of that, uh, you know, from crickets that we have been able to do. Um, talking about sensors, gyroscopes and accelerometers, well, we have focused more on gyroscopes that are usually, uh, you know, fairly difficult structures to make. These are big structures with lots of uh, moving components in them. And, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a question of creating this technology in the country so that we can produce gyro gyros are used in uh, you know all kinds of aerospace structures used in um, also 
our own, uh, you know, in in uh, video games, in accelerometer, in in um, uh, cell phones, etc. So um, gyroscopes, uh, we have been dense uh, and by ISRO also to develop this uh, here. So we have developed the gyroscope, and right now we are trying to integrate uh, electronics with it, have a fully packaged gyro package so that, that can be used in uh, aerospace applications. Uh, there is a lot, lot of work in LX integration that needs to be done. Um, the structure part, the sensor element itself has been fabricated at our own center, and we are able to now fabricate this uh, in, 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 in one or two weeks, we can fabricate the whole structure. So we have mastered the technology. But uh, now uh, the signal processing and uh, electronics uh, integration and packaging, that's the kind of... In um, piezoelectric micro-machined ultrasound transducers or PMUDs, again, we have been able to make this uh, multi led stack of, uh, of materials where you have let's say silicon as the base, silicon as the passive layer, and then you have on top of that uh, a metal electrode, on top of that a piezoelectric layer, you know, it could be PZT layer, and then on top of that another metal layer so that you have electrodes on both sides of the PZT layer. And then we have been able to make these uh, ultrasound transducers from them, uh, and uh, we have shown that they work very well, anywhere about 50 kilohertz to 2 or 3 megahertz uh, PMUDs we have been able to make. And right now we are uh, trying to uh, create applications with these PMUDs and there are lots of applications in, in, uh, in fluid probing, in um, biological uh, molecule probing, uh, also for imaging probes that are used in um, uh, endoscopy or uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery, in, in those kinds of things, these, uh, these devices are used. So we are looking at integrating these PMUDs in those applications. Um, speakers, MEM speakers, we have been able to make very, very thin and uh, very efficient speakers. Actually, the speakers that we have made are uh, 10 times more energy efficient than any speakers as of now in the world. So these speakers came from um, how crickets, how insects, these insects called crickets, um, those make such loud and we studied their, their mechanism. We understood what kind of scaling was used, was used and uh, that's what we have now used all that knowledge to create a speaker. So that's what you said. Uh, you know, innovative new design. Um, and then uh, we are also looking at uh, using stress in MEM structures. Uh, when you make MEM structures out of thin films, they necessarily have some stress or the other coming from the processes, stresses. So how do you use residual stresses uh, themselves as, um, as a design parameter? You know, since it is going to be there, you might as well exploit it. So we are uh, looking at how to easily find out how much stress is there in a, in a structure, uh, how much residual stress is left, and how those residual stresses are affected by different processes so that we can induce the level of stress we want and use that for sensing. For example, you know, if it is compressive stress, then near the buckling uh, uh, stress of a, of a structure, let's say a fixed fixed beam, you will find that the structure becomes extremely sensitive to any perturbations as far as it, its dynamic response is um, uh, concerned. So can we use this state to make extremely sensitive uh, sensors? Okay, sensors for gases, sensors for, you know, vapor, water vapor, moisture, you know, or uh, other other stresses. So potentially use stresses as uh, sensors too. So that's another um, thing that we look at in uh, in our 
MEMS, uh, MEMS sensor portfolio. Now, electromigration, as I said, we have studied this phenomenon. Uh, it's very, very rich in science. So if you want to do really some cool physics, uh, electromigration has a lot to offer. Uh, in terms of technology, how to use it for mass transport, how to use it for uh, you know, self-assembled or uh, self-created patterns, that's uh, something that uh, can give you uh, several technologies. So that's another thing we are looking at. And as I said in the beginning, we are creating this product with which we, we will be able to uh, write nanoscale. At nanoscales, we will be able to create patterns. It will be without using any high vacuum, uh, high fields for accelerating electrons, which is currently done in EB lithography uh, that we use for uh, nano patterning. So, um, that's that. And in energy harvesting, we have been able to make energy harvesters that that uh, can power uh, sensor nodes. Uh, one of the pictures you see here, you know, in the third picture, you see a smoke alarm. So we have a smoke alarm cafe, which has been running, which has been running now for uh, almost three years um, on energy that we supply from uh, uh, air ducts on the roof of our building. On the roof of the building, there are air ducts, they're carrying air and they keep vibrating and that vibrating into electrical energy using our energy. Alloys. And those are like uh, these uh, cantilever beams with piezoelectric patches that you see in the... And then we take that energy down um, through, of course, you have a you have a modulation circuit, and then uh, you know you, you power. Now this is just for demonstration, but we can power LED lighting, and uh, we can power several other sensors. So this is this is something that uh, we are developing right now. And then energy that I was talking about, you know, bioacoustics of cricket. Cricket. We have just studied how crickets make so much of sound. Looking at how uh, how do female crickets um, have their ears completely tuned to very narrow frequencies uh, at which their male counterparts and these these frequencies are different from species. So are they designed so that with uh, just tiny bit of difference in the design, uh, they act like uh, this uh, narrow band, band pass filters, um, and these are all mechanical filters. So we are trying to learn that technology from nature so that we can uh, create our own speakers, which will be extremely selective. Similarly, you know, from, uh, from this uh, flies, you know, um, we are trying to understand how they use their organs called haltiers. You know, those are the hind wings of uh, solar flies. You know, several insects uh, of uh, fly family use these haltiers. They use haltiers as sensing elements. So these rate sensing elements are incredibly beautiful in design. We have no gyroscope of that elegance or of that kind of functionality in MEMS right now. It is extremely simple looking, but very, very clever design. So we have just understood how it works. We haven't yet figured out how to um, make that kind of gyroscope uh, MEMS technology. Next uh, kind. Kind of. And um, other other things that we're working on is uh, experimenting on cells, uh, biological cells. We vibrate. We just put these cells, culture them, and put them um, on a substrate uh, and uh, use them as mechanical structures and measure their response, vibration response. And from there, we are able to make out if 
the cell has any disease in it, you know, including cancer. So this is just vibration signatures we are able to say whether a cell has, uh, you know, some pathology or not. So this is what I call mechanodiagnostics. Um, you know, all the diagnostics right now is all chemical based. You know, you go and give your blood or urine or whatever, and you know, that is tested for particular biomarkers. But you can do uh, several diseases can be detected also from the changes in the structure of the cell itself when they get their disease and uh, that structural change manifests itself in change in stiffness or uh, you know adjacent properties or other mechanical properties of the cell that you get from their vibration signatures so that's a very active area of research in my group and we are looking at uh, you know developing this as a technique um, so but you know <clears throat> one thing which uh, really excites me is that this is smallest insect in the world which is just about you know its entire length is uh, 200 microns and microns it has sensors actuators processors everything packaged in in 200 microns length now i mean here is a marvel of nature's engineering create an artificial fairy fly I mean, this this will be an amazing feat if one can do it so i'll just leave you with this picture and uh, if you if you are tickled by any of this then um, you should talk to me and uh, i'll be happy to discuss with you possibilities of uh, all kinds of research in these areas thanks so we are all done for today's uh, schedule all faculty members are done <laughs> it's a last so one day you said please make a connection between uh, mechanobiology and uh, biomechanics. And biomechanics. Okay. So should I do it now or I guess it's over. Broadcasting is it still yes. yes. I don't know if the student is still there. So can I go ahead and say? Yes, yes. Okay. So um, you know there was a there was a question somebody wanted to um, wanted me to make a connection between um, biomechanics and mechanobiology. Um, you know, for many people, um, you know, it's. Uh, it's actually not. Uh, biomechanics is studying the mechanics of biological systems, okay, uh, biological entities. You know, it could be you are uh, trying to understand the mechanics of cells. But mechanobiology, on the other hand, is our knowledge of mechanics and then designing, you know, uh, biological systems, uh, biological entity is things. So mechanobiology um, is more of an engineering approach uh, to exploiting what we know about mechanics 
and uh, then taking it to uh, biological systems. Of course, you know, I mean, it, it's not like there is a very, very a hard line that is drawn that when do you call it mechanobiology, when you call it uh, biomechanics, um, you know, people quite often use it, uh, you know, interchangeably, but uh, it's the kind of that exists in biomimetics and bio-inspired engineering. You know, so biomimetics is just that the functionality of something that you see in a biological system, you are trying to mimic that. Whereas bio-inspired engineering is uh, learning the design of that biological system, the way nature has designed it, you know, the kind of design of the biological system uh, that exists, the design principle is to track out, and then you want uh, that principle to be used in, um, in engineering systems. So that's uh, bio-inspired engineering. So there are, there are new, ones, you know, subtleties, there are fine lines uh, between these uh, terms. And uh, I guess you will uh, learn more and more as you get into the field and work in the field. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>